so before I get started, uh, again, my name is James Hamby. Um, I'm as near as you can be to a Delawarean without being a Delawarean. It was by accident of birth, actually born at Curzon Ch Chester Hospital. Uh, my parents lived across the line in Upper Chai when I was born, uh, but my families do go all the way back to the Kelmar Nickel. Um, pretty much all of the families that you think of when you think of old Brandywine 100 um, are my um, ancestors, uh, the forwards, the um, tallies, the grubs, um, the days, um, the zebblies, uh, all of those either are direct descendant or direct ancestors or intermarried into to the family. Um, before I get started in the formal program, since since Mike brought up uh, Granite Corinthian Lodge in Lombardi, um, I would like to um, publicly thank Dee, who came to our, I guess, our last open, open house pre-COVID at Lombardi Hall. I'm not going to talk about Lombardi tonight, but it's a fascinating thing that would be a great topic at some other time, it was the country home of Gunning Bedford, uh, who signed the Constitution from Delaware. Um, but thanks to, uh, to Dee's efforts and the county executive's efforts, uh, we were able to get historic um, tax exemption for Lombardi Hall, uh, which saves us, uh, I don't know, Mike, about $3,400 a year, give or take a little bit. Um, anybody that has anything remoting, remotely uh, pertaining to a historic structure knows it's an extremely expensive proposition to keep up. And so uh, every little bit helps. And so being recognized as that um, from the county is a, is a big deal and has, has helped us in our efforts to preserve Lombardi Hall for future generations. Um, before I launch my PowerPoint, um, since I have my background from work up, I am a justice of the peace for the state of Delaware. Um, and have been for coming up on 16 years now. Um, and, and one of the quick little stories that I'll tell um, actually involves what is one of probably the first attempts at uh, political bribery in Delaware. Um, William Penn, when he got the uh, three lower counties, and as we say in Delaware, the upper 67 counties of Delaware, otherwise known as Pennsylvania, um, he looked at it and, and decided he wanted to establish these great manors that had like 5,000 acres in them. And he wanted to, to put one down here in uh, Brandywine 100. And right near the river, uh, there was a man named John Grubb who had um, about 200 acres. Um, and uh, John was, I guess he's about my ninth great grandfather, uh, served in the, in the General Assembly a couple times for, for Delaware when we met together with Pennsylvania. Um, but Penn uh, diligently tried to buy him out while he was here. And then he went back to England and his lieutenant governor and land agent, John Logan, uh, there's numbers of letters back and forth between him and Penn, speaking of that man, that troublesome man, John Grubb, because Grubb refused to give up what we know as Grubb's Landing. Um, and so Penn hit upon making him a justice of the peace. So it comes honest in my family that it's been all those years. Uh, but Grubb accepted the appointment as justice of the peace and still didn't sell him the land. So it really didn't work out for William Penn. Um, and we have Grubb's Landing today rather than, than something else there. Um, so that's an interesting story about politics and our world. Let me just launch my screen here. Um, when D asked for a title, I thought, geez, what the heck do I call this? Um, and so I came upon rambles and reflections, some stories about Brandywine 100 history. And I didn't entirely come up with it on my own. Uh, there's a book that I own called Rambles and Reflections at Home and Abroad by- James, sorry, yeah. we, uh, did you share your screen already? Cause I don't see anything. Oh, okay, hold on. I hit all the buttons, but that. <laughs> Let me go back out. I do this every day. There we go. Okay, there you go. All right. Okay, you see it now. Um, so there's a book called Rambles and Reflections at Home and Abroad written by Thomas Jefferson Clayton, um, who actually was the presiding judge of Delaware County for over 30 years. But the Clayton family, much like all of my families, straddled the line between Bethel Township and uh, Brandywine 100. And uh, all of them, um, went to church uh, at that time um, at what was then known as Bethel uh, Methodist 
Episcopal Church um, on Falk Road, which later became Chester Bethel. And so he has an intimate connection with Brandywine 100. And many of his stories um, are related to uh, Brandywine 100 uh, through the years. Um, and we'll talk about them when we get in further. But that is the good judge. Um, in his later years, as he did, like many Americans who reached a certain status level, as far as wealth, he toured extensively in Europe. And he wrote letters, essentially dispatches for newspapers back here. And friends um, wanted copies of all those. And so he eventually uh, pulled them all together and then also included the biographical information from around here in Bethel Township and published that book in 1892 and it sold out. Um, and so he turned around and made some minor corrections and published it again in 1893. And I'm lucky enough to own several copies of both editions. Um, some years ago, some of you may have seen the, the book that we republished uh, by Barbara McEwing, Neighbors of the Great Valley Turnpike. And she has this map in it um, of, it's the Beers Atlas of 1868. I know it's hard to see on the screen, but if you've ever seen it, you know that it's one of the maps that has all the property owners um, from 1868 of Brandywine 100 uh, interspersed. Um, and so for somebody like me who loves history, it's really great to be able to look and see where my various members of my family lived in 1868 clearly um, on the map. One of the first things that I wanted to talk about was uh, forward school. Um, I will note, because I could talk about 18,000 different things and take up three or four different meetings. So I'm not gonna talk about um, Newark Union, uh, except in passing because the dailies have done a great job and I think they need to do a, a, a show on that um, and what work they've been doing there. Um, and I'm also not going to talk about uh, the Hamby Trust, although I think that it's a interesting thing that would also be a topic. I will say, I was just out there tonight, was disappointed to find that we've had some vandalism out there, both at the cottage on the corner and in uh, some of the buildings. Um, and uh, so for those of you that live in Arden, keep an eye out. If you see something, say something, the county is investigating it. Um, and hopefully they, there are cameras up on the, in the, the main part of the, the Y and they have the individuals on camera. So hopefully we'll be able to catch them, but um, clearly some folks um, thought that it was interesting or a good time to break windows out of a nonprofit facility. Um, some of you were aware a couple of years ago that the forward school was uh, torn down. The forward school at the time that it was torn down was probably the, the oldest structure built in America solely for public free education. So let that think, sink in a little bit. It was torn down and it was the oldest existing structure that was built for public free education in the United States. And it was right here in Brandy 100. Um, the land was given and the, and the uh, structure was built in 1799. Uh, this was before all of the uh, local areas were being taxed to, to build schools on their own. The local folks around the forward school um, tax themselves to build the school. And uh, Robert Forward and J. Hugh Forward uh, built the school. Uh, it was expanded. It was originally 20 by 20. It was expanded to 40 by 20 in the 1840s, 1850s. Um, and so that's what everybody remembers is the expanded school. Um, there is a current proposal, which has been lagging for quite some time to develop that approximately 12 acre parcel, um, which would um, call for the erection of a school to the size of the original 1799 school, a 20 by 20, which would serve as a place, a repository, hopefully for um, some articles of, of local history. Um, it is supposed to be the first thing that's built when they build anything. I, I don't know, I have not heard in quite some time what the status of any of the construction out there is. Uh, currently the, the school sits in a pile uh, when they tore it down. There was numerous uh, structural issues and they tore it down and it's further back on the site um, and it's, it's a pile of rocks right now. Um, so that is the status of the forward school. The picture that I'm showing shows um, students in the late 1800s. Uh, forward, the people, the taxpayers of the forward school district 
actually fought consolidation in the 1930s. And so this structure, in addition to being um, the oldest uh, for a public school, um, also existed the longest as a public school because it was not forced to consolidate until 1939. So there are still with us um, seniors who went to the forward school. Forward school was also important because um, long about 1844, uh, the slavery issue was becoming a heated topic in church. And the Methodist Episcopal Church uh, took it upon itself to forbid the discussion of slavery and or political topics in the churches. So Chester Bethel, at that time still Bethel, you couldn't discuss what was going on in the country at church. And so Forward School served as the community center for Brandywine 100. And there were debates with hundreds of people out underneath of those big old trees. And they would debate the issue of slavery and the issue of politics in the 1840s and 1850s. And out of that, uh, after the war started, um, Robert Forward's grandson, William Henry Forward, uh, who was born in 1838, uh, he joined the US Army, he was a doctor, and he decided to make the Army his career. And he stayed in the Army uh, until he reached mandatory retirement age. Uh, about 18 months before he reached mandatory retirement age, he was selected as the US Army Surgeon General. Um, now, he was near the end of his career, so it was certainly an honor they felt they were given to him because he was almost aging out. But it also was because the other person up for the honor of being Surgeon General was Walter Reed. And Walter Reed was hated by the military establishment. And so they, they gave the title of Surgeon General to General Forward. Walter Reed then went on to uh, distinguish himself in, in fighting disease. And so we have Walter Reed Hospital today. Had he not done that, there, it very well could have been the William Henry Forward Hospital uh, because it was dedicated uh, not too long after General Forward had retired, um, but Walter Reed had died by that point. But up until that point, he was hated by the army hierarchy and they would have never named anything after him. Um, but when you become a hero, a lot of that gets forgotten. Uh, William is buried down in Arlington. Um, his father, Robert, um, as well as uh, my fifth great grandfather, uh, Jehu and their wives are buried at Newark Union. Um, over there. Uh, everybody's seen the, actually, uh, this is the picture D has on the invitation for tonight, uh, where it was in pretty bad shape. Um, and the other picture in the corner there is the date stone. Um, the date stone was preserved by um, Joe Setting, who has the, the project there at the corner. It's in his office. He sent me a picture of it. Um, but that is the RF um, and 1799 when, when the original structure was created. So moving on from forward, uh, another school that some of you, depending upon when you moved to Delaware, may or may not have remembered, was the old schoolhouse number four or the Hamby schoolhouse, which sat at the corner of Marsh and Naaman's Road. Uh, the TD Bank sits there now. Um, the Hamby School was built, or was built on land, a half acre of ground that was given uh, by my fourth great grandfather, John Hanby in 1810. So it was about nine or 10 years after the Tally School, but it served all of the kids um, up in that area. Um, and that's a picture, the oldest picture we have of kids at Hamby School, which was about 1885, 1886, based on some of the folks that we know that are in the picture and their, their birth dates. This school, um, closed and was consolidated with the Alfred I. DuPont School um, in uh, 1934, 1935. Um, for those who don't know, the Alfred I. DuPont School was on Conquer Pike where Staples is. There is still a portion of the fence that went around it that is out by Conquer Pike. That's the sole remaining uh, reminder of uh, the Alfred I. DuPont School. Uh, it was still there when I was a kid, we played baseball and name is Little League behind it, uh, but then it was torn down for uh, that whole shopping center where Staples is. I went there. You went there? Yep. Uh, Mr. DuPont, when he built it, my great-grandfather, John Amer Husbands, was on the board when they went to Mr. DuPont and asked him for the money to build the school. 
And every year at Christmas time, Mr. DuPont would come and bring gifts for the kids. And he was deaf. He had a tin horn that he would hold up to his ear so he could hear the children when they were uh, speaking. Um, so he, he kept, a, until he passed away, he kept a very close uh, relationship with the school that bore his name. Out of this school too, um, as the first teaching position, Dr. Francis Harvey Green uh, taught here, the first place he taught as a school teacher. He married a local girl, but he was from Bethel Township. Um, and anybody that's went to Westchester knows that the library at Westchester is named for Dr. Francis Harvey Green. In Bethel Township, there used to be a Francis Harvey Green school, but it has been torn down and no longer exists anymore. But this was the first place that he taught school uh, before he went on to be one of the premier uh, educators in the late 1800s, early 1900s. This is also the school that Albert Thatcher Hanby went to. Um, he was born in, in 1885 and uh, he went here. He later then went to Westchester. Um, and while he was at Westchester, he was the president of his class and uh, he ended up going as president of his class to DC on their final senior trip, uh, where he got to meet and introduce everybody that was in the class to President Theodore Roosevelt. So that was kind of the highlight of his life for that up to that point, meeting Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he went on to Penn Law School and then became a, a lawyer in Philadelphia. And the, the Hamby Trust is the farm that was left to him by his, his father. Um, and so that's where that, that comes in there. But this is where he started out before he went on to be a successful Philadelphia lawyer as well. Now, one of the probably most interesting stories um, in Brandywine 100, um, and I think it really ties back to the slavery discussion, which was prohibited. Um, but in the 1840s, uh, then Bethel Church, um, and this picture of the, with the green serpentine face is, we call it the old church, but it's the new church. Um, the old church was the other side of the graveyard uh, and was built about 1780 and was a, a log structure that was then replaced by a stone structure. And then this church was built in the 1870s. So the things that occurred that I'm going to speak about occurred at the really old church down the other side of the, uh, the graveyard. Um, they couldn't talk about uh, slavery and so they talked about other things. Some of the young folks decided that they wanted to form a choir. Uh, which was pretty unheard of in the Methodist Church. Um, the Methodist Church had, had broken off of the, um, the Church of England. Um, John Wesley was the founder, but uh, although he remained an Episcopalian priest to his death, he, he knew that he had started something else, and that's why we have uh, the United Methodists here, because he sent bishops to, uh, after the revolution in 1784, to kind of manage things here as a separate church. Uh, but in the 1840s, uh, these folks decided they wanted to um, have a choir. And so they petitioned the board of trustees. They asked them to nail some thin pieces of wood to the back of the pews where they wanted to sit to hold their music. Um, and had they not done that and talked about music, they probably would have been okay. But in the old primitive Methodist church, Printed choir music uh, was regarded as the work of the devil. Um, Judge Clayton re uh, talks about it in his book where he stopped one day to have a horse shod um, across the street from the Oddfellows Hall there above Arden, uh, where the tattoo parlor is. Uh, there was Samuel Grubb had his uh, blacksmith shop. And so Judge Clayton stopped to have a horse shod and they were talking about the troubles at church because they both were members of Bethel. And uh, Grubb got very upset and uh, Judge Clayton tried to reason with him and talked about uh, David and his lute and, and various things of scripture to talk about singing and dancing. Um, all of that just continued to make uh, Samuel Grubb even more upset. He resolved that he was gonna take his blacksmith hammer up the church at the next opportunity and knock those strips off of the back of those pews. It caused an enormous discontent within the church the older folks thought that it was a return to the ritualistic principles of the Church of England. The younger folks thought that the old folks were trying to stifle them. Um, and 
many a Sunday, whether there was a choir or not, was determined by who got to the church first. And the older women of the church got to where they would get up at the crack of dawn to go to church and sit in the pews so that the younger folks, by the time they got there, could find no place to sit. Uh, there were disturbances. Somebody's hair got, caught, got cut uh, at church. Uh, the uh, constables were called out. Some of the older ladies were called into court for uh, disturbing the peace. Um, they put the pastor on trial. Uh, they had people who alleged that they saw the pastor drinking in Philadelphia, which in the Methodist church then and to a certain extent now is still kind of frowned upon. Um, in, in, in short, as Judge Clayton says, uh, the devil in the guise of a notebook entered the church. Uh, a huge number of the church withdrew um, and they first met at the old Towie schoolhouse, which sat where the Exxon station is um, on Concord Pike at Naaman's Road, kind of at that corner. The, the whole old Brandywine racetrack property was all Tally property back then. Um, and so they had set aside a, a place for a Tally school. Um, they met there for a bit and then they met um, at Grace Church, let them meet in their church, which is across from Concord Pike, still to this, across from Concord Mall, still to this day. Um, but ultimately, they hit upon um, Samuel Hance and Samuel Hamby, giving them, giving each giving three quarters of an acre to build Siloam United Methodist Church or Siloam Methodist Episcopal at that time, just up the street, less than a half mile away from Chester Bethel. This did not sit well with the folks at Bethel. They petitioned the bishop to force them to, to move. And the bishop sided with the folks that were building Siloam because he couldn't argue with free ground to build the church. Um, as Judd Clayton re, uh, relates, um, it split families. Families didn't talk to the other side of families for generations. Um, my family was amongst those that went to Siloam, but they already had burial plots at Chester Bethel. And so as late as my grandfather's brothers and sisters, who were six of them that were unmarried, they all were buried at Chester Bethel, even though they never set foot in Chester Bethel Church for a church service. Um, but that was the the, the break was so uh, firm. Uh, in later years, they did manage to patch it up enough that we would from time to time have joint services during Easter or Thanksgiving or uh, Holy Week. Um, but they truly functioned, even though they were a half mile apart as entirely separate congregations um, for many, many years. This is in the old part of the cemetery, um, looking north towards the old church. And so, the, the original church would have been behind me in this picture. Um, there's a house there now, a modern house where the old church would have sat. Uh, Robert Cloud set aside land originally there. Um, Thomas Webb came through, was a Methodist preacher um, and he spoke and a, a society got formed in about 1775 and that was the nucleus of, of Bethel. Um, and so Robert Cloud gave the land, it was Cloud's Chapel, was, it was known as for a while, and then it became Bethel. Then uh, in the mid 1800s, when they got rid of the Chester Circuit, which this was a part of, um, the church voted to add Chester to their name uh, in honor of the old Chester Circuit. And so that's how Chester Bethel came to be. Um, now this is Samuel Hanby. Uh, he was my uh, third great grandfather. Um, lived from 1817 to 1892. He was one of the ones that led the effort to, to remove up the street. He owned the farm there. His house is still there, just two doors uh, towards Delaware. This is actually in Bethel Township, but two doors towards Delaware on Falk Road. Um, and he and Samuel Hans, who was, Samuel Hans was a local licensed pastor and owned the adjoining farm. And so he gave three, three quarters of an acre and Samuel gave three quarters of an acre. And in the history of Siloam, we refer to them as first and second Samuel um, because they made it possible for the church to, uh, to exist. When they dedicated the church in September of 1852, they still owed about $3,500. And the pastor got to talk and there was a number of pastors there. Um, they had a church service and then they had lunch and then they had another church service. And essentially they kept taking up the offering until they raised the entire amount to burn the mortgage that day when they dedicated the church. Uh, down in Chester Bethel, there is a state marker. Um, 
that talks about the church and Thomas Webb. Um, in the mid early uh, 60s, they decided they needed a new church, which is when they built the, uh, the new structure that everybody's familiar with as Chester Bethel was in 1972. In the Siloam uh, Cemetery, when you walk through cemeteries and Bob Daly, uh, you and Ann probably can attest to this, you see things that give you a shock at some point. The, the photo on the left, Godfrey R. Hanby, uh, there used to be a big bush that covered most of his stone. And so when I was out digging around in the cemetery looking for ancestors, there's this whole Hanby plot there. Um, and I pushed aside the, the bush so I could see what was written there. And it was July 4th, 1871, which is my birthday 100 years later, which was kind of, you know, taken aback a little bit. So, um, but he's he's buried there. Uh, next to him or across from him, his father, Robert Johnson Hanby, um, served in the Pennsylvania, uh, in the 124th Pennsylvania during the Civil War. After the Civil War, he uh, went to Philadelphia and was elected to a term as Philadelphia City Council person. Um, and then after that, uh, the call to come home to Delaware uh, beckoned to him, and he moved back to, uh, to Delaware, to Holyoke, um, and he married and had uh, several kids. And um, in the 1890s, he decided he wanted to be a part of politics in Delaware, and so he got elected as a Republican to the Delaware State Senate. Um, one of his friends was the person who is known as Gas Ab Addicts, um, who had, was, had moved to Delaware, had won a small fortune in gas in Massachusetts and had come and really at first thought he was in Delaware County. And then somebody said, no, you're in the state of Delaware. Uh, but he decided he wanted the United States Senate seat. And at that time, uh, the General Assembly elected uh, our senators. And so Robert Hanby, uh, Robert Johnson Hanby was one of his lieutenants in Dover. And if you go and look at the records of the General Assembly in the 1890s, you will see that they opened with vote after vote after vote trying to break the logjam. They closed with vote after vote after vote to try to break the logjam. Um, at one point, both United States Senate seats were empty. We had no United States senators representing Delaware in the United States Senate. They bargained with some of the regular Republicans and said, you know, how about if we elect a Democrat to one of the seats? Um, and so they did elect a Democrat to one of the seats, uh, but then nobody would get on board to elect either gas addicts or another Republican um, to the other seat. Uh, eventually um, there was uh, T. Coleman DuPont was elected, um, but for an extended period of time in the 1890s and early 1900s, Delaware was either only had one Senator or no representation, um, which is, to a large extent, one of the reasons why we have popular election of United States senators today to prevent that. But uh, Robert was involved in that, um, which is a black mark on his career. But the, the, the good thing that he did was he did attempt um, right before he died in 1898 to introduce a constitutional amendment to allow, the, allow women uh, to be members of the bar in Delaware. So he was a little ahead of his time there. Unfortunately, he died and, and his amendment to the constitution died with him, uh, but he was at least thinking and in the next generation, uh, his son Frederick uh, married a woman named Florence Wood. Um, and so Florence Wood Hanby in 1924 uh, was elected to the Delaware uh, House of Representatives, was the first woman elected to the Delaware House of Representatives uh, as a Holyoke Republican. And when she went down there, there was at least some uh, scuttlebutt that maybe they'd turn around and elect her Speaker of the House just to make a, a, a bigger deal out of it, but they didn't do that. Um, and she served one term and, and that was it, but she broke the barrier. Um, and at that time, when she went to the, to the General Assembly, there were no restrooms for ladies down there because all of the clerks and all of the people serving were all men. So they had to make some uh, adjustments for Florence when she was in session. Picture on the right, or on the left rather, is Siloam, one of the oldest pictures that I have, um, which is probably about 1881. Um, Falk Road is much closer to the front of the church these days. One of the things that we talked about before was the importance of documents. And so these next couple things are um, pictures of a family Bible that I have of William and Jane Husbands. 
Um, and so the one on the left is the whole page. The one on the right is William Husbands, uh, who departed this life the 6th of January um, in 1856. Um, this was when uh, he was born in 1786 and when his wife was born, Jane McBride in 1789. Now the Bible was copyrighted in 1811. And so they, they got it after the fact um, and then wrote in everything. They, they were married in 1811. They went back and wrote in their births after the fact, obviously because they were the start of the, the family. But here on the right-hand side, you can see uh, William Husbands and Jane McBride uh, married March 28, uh, 1811. This is the one thing I'll say about New York Union. I, when when I had the books for the reprints for the uh, uh, Neighbors of the Great Valley Turnpike, uh, Bob asked for one, and I said, "Sure, I'd be happy to bring one out." And he said, "Well, stop out anytime. We're out there working and everything." And so I stopped out, and I, I mentioned this to Larry Nagengast when he uh, did his most recent article. It happened that as I walked up into the cemetery they're working on these two stones and the, the surrounding sections. And of course, the first thing I'm thinking to my mind is what the heck are they doing to my ancestors? Um, but of course I had a conversation with them. I never even realized that there were uh, boundaries to the graves that had sunk down into the ground and the work that they've done out there is just amazing. But this is, um, this is their stones there at Newark Union Cemetery. Another scrap of paper, which to many people wouldn't, I mean, this is a uh, William Pennington. Um, he was summoned uh, to appear uh, for a uh, jury in Delaware County. Again, they lived back and forth across the line. He was in Bethel Township at this time. Um, you have all gotten jury summons. I have gotten jury summons. Did you keep them? Probably not. This was from 1823 and somebody in my family kept it and it got passed down through the generations to my grandmother who gave it to me knowing that I would keep it for future generations. But it's just interesting that, you know, here is something that, um, you know, ordinarily would have been probably disposed of and, and we have it for posterity and, and know that he was summoned for a jury in August of 1823. The next one, which is um, to me even more interesting because it's merely a receipt. It's received the seventh month, 18th day of 1839 of William Pennington, $9 for a coffin that he made for, that I made for his father. And it's signed by William Larkin. Well, at the time, these two men, William Larkin was a carpenter. William Pennington was a farmer. His dad died. He went to the carpenter and said, hey, can you build me a coffin? And the guy said, sure, I'll make you a coffin for your dad. It'll be $9. He gives him this receipt. You fast forward generations down. Actually, my father would be, but I'm, he doesn't care about it as much as I do. We are, direct descendants of both of these men. At the time when he wrote the receipt, they were just two local people doing business, writing receipts. Little would they know that their generations would come together. You know, uh, when my grandparents got married in 1945, over a hundred years later, um, and unite the two families between the Larkins and the Penningtons. Now the Penningtons um, who came over, uh, not on the same boat as Penn, but near the same time as Penn, um, the original Isaac Pennington, uh, Sir Isaac, uh, sided with Cromwell during the British, uh, during the Civil War, um, and sat on the committee that voted to behead Charles I. Uh, he didn't sign it, but he sat on the committee. And so when Cromwell died and they, the, the Lords decided that this uh, whole Republican thing probably wasn't going very well, um, they asked Charles II to come back. And one of the things they made Charles II promise was that he would not go after those that had persecuted his father. Of course, as soon as Charles became king, that's exactly what he did. Now, during the time that Cromwell was, um, the, was in charge, the Lord Protector, as he called himself, uh, he placed Sir Isaac in charge of the Tower of London. So when Charles II came to the throne, he seized Isaac, had him sentenced to death, and he was imprisoned in his own Tower of London where in December of 1661, he died of ill use, as the record says. And if you've ever been to the Tower of London and seen some of those instruments of torture that they have downstairs, um, you can only imagine what ill use amounted to. Um, but his son uh, had become a Quaker 
And he had married a widow who had a young daughter. And so he raised the daughter up as a Quaker. And one day, uh, William Penn came calling and fell in love with his daughter, and which was the stepdaughter of Isaac's. And uh, they got married. And so all of um, Isaac's children were half brothers and sisters with William Penn's first wife. And so when, when Charles II threw their dad in prison, seized their estates, they decided it was probably the better part of valor to, to get out of the town and to go with their brother-in-law, William Penn, to this new place called Pennsylvania. And so that's how the, Pen the Penningtons ended up coming over here. They settled both in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania and then down into Delaware. But that's, to me, like we talked about before, uh, the issue of documents, the issues of, of books. Um, like I say, I have Judge Clayton's book, several versions of, Clayton, of Judge Clayton's books um, that have been passed down to me. Um, there are loads of those things that are out there that just end up getting thrown away all of the time where, because people don't have any interest so they don't know what to do with them. And that certainly is one of the things that a uh, historical society could serve as a repository for some of those things. I know when Miss Talley, uh, who was the daughter of the, the Talley that sold the county, the Talley portion of Talley Day Park, uh, when she died, there were a number of family Bibles and other things that went for sale. Um, some were claimed by various members of the family, but they really all should have went to some place that would have preserved them um, instead of getting dispersed. But they had just been in that little building uh, behind the Newcastle County Library until she died because she wouldn't let anybody in the building. So um, we have much work to do, I guess would be my point on that. Um, and with that, I will stop, stop sharing and endeavor to ask, answer questions if people have some. Don't everybody jump at once. <laughs> I see Dave has his hand up. Yeah, um, I'm wondering about two houses and one I, I really hope you know something about. It's the old uh, farm, I think it's stone and frame farmhouse that sits uh, down slope from the original site of the Bethel Church. The Armstrongs lived there in the early yeah. 1970s when I lived near there. Uh, do you know anything about that place? And the other the other one is the, the somewhat derelict uh, big uh, farmhouse on Penny Hill that sits not too far from the Penny House on the same side of the road. It's back farther back from the road, but it seems to have been vacant most of the time in recent years. And I was hoping somebody might preserve that. So anything you could tell about either of those, I'd appreciate. Yeah, the, the, the first one or last one first, I guess, um, that house behind there, it was occupied at one point because I had kind of went back there to, I had the same impression you did that it looked like it was abandoned. Um, there was actually somebody living there. They weren't interested in talking. Um, but certainly um, that might be something that John Cartier, that's probably been 15 or more years ago. The Penny House itself was just recently sold. I believe Carolyn Rowland sold it. Um, so it, yeah, it's something that's on my radar. Uh, as far as the other one, the Armstrongs married into the Hamby family um, and also the Cloud family. That really was all, all that land there was part of what Robert Cloud owned um, back in the day. So I haven't done the actual deed work on it, but I would suspect that it goes back to being Robert Cloud's house because that was his farm. And then the modern house is just the other side of it is where he gave the land to build the church, the original church. So, uh, you know, digging it's well kept so i haven't really jumped into it because the people there seem to really love it and take care of it so it it hasn't been on my agenda as being a threatened structure but i would think that if you go back to the deeds you'll probably go back to robert cloud mr Thiemel. i have one question and one comment yes the stone school in claymont yes is that not older than the forward school it is not. Uh, John Dickinson gave the land for the Claymont Stone School in 1805. That's Second on their stone ago. up top. Second thing, I just want to comment. Somebody we knew fairly well from vacation, her name was Isabel Hanby Telly. Mm -hmm. And she said she used to tell us about the feud between the Hanby and the Telly families. Could you just say a little bit about that? I could. That That is an entirely uh, separate, it could be an entire program on its own. But in short, 
Um, John Wesley Hanby and Isaac Talley um, got into it uh, in the summer of 1885. Um, there was a dispute over buying some cows at the uh, local, uh, when they went to buy calves. Um, and John Wesley Talley drew back and reports differ on whether or not he struck Isaac Talley's father or not, but there was at least words and then it, it just disintegrated from there into bad blood. Um, in the winter of 1886, in January of 1886, there was a tremendous blizzard that hit Brandywine 100. And so Marsh Road, as you're going down towards, it was actually known as Hay Road at the time, but if you're going down towards the river, uh, Marsh Road was pretty impassable. And Isaac Talley's farm was along Marsh Road. And the rules of the road back then, you had road commissioners and they, they took care of the roads and everything. But the rules of the road were that if the road was impassable, and there was a means of egress and, and to, to cross, uh, the farmer was supposed to allow his fellow people to use essentially his field as an access. And so to avoid the drifts on the lower Marsh Road, there was people were going across Isaac Talley's fields to get to Marsh Road further up, just kind of cross his farm. And Isaac uh, objected and said he had planted winter, winter wheat there. And so he didn't want it all trampled down. And so he said, you can go across further up. And I don't have any problem with that. Um, but of course, word got to John Wesley Hanby and he said, oh, I'm going through right where everybody else has been going through, whether you like it or not. And that word got back to Tally. And so on the fateful morning, Hanby got up and loaded his cattle he was taking to, to, to market and in a cart. And his father had heard about the trouble. So his father came along, Joseph Hanby, um, and Isaac Talley, having um, heard about it, was sitting on the rails uh, at the place where the, the alleged crossing was going to take place. And so there were words that were back and forth. Um, Hamby pulled a shotgun that he had. He was very hot tempered and pretty much a bully from everything I've been able to read, um, both in the newspapers and just family history. Um, and he went to fire and his shotgun didn't go off. And Isaac Talley, who had a pistol in his pocket, uh, exclaimed to his wife, my God, he's trying to kill me. And he pulls out his pistol and shoots Hanby. Um, Hanby falls to the ground, pretty much dead on contact. Um, his brother comes down, Benjamin Franklin Hanby comes down. He and his father get him up into the wagon. They take him back to the house. The doctor's called for. There's nothing that could be done. Now, in the pushing and shoving, Hamby had also had had a, um, a, they call it a gambrel, but it's some sort of metal, uh, kind of like a scythe. And he had struck Tally about the head several times uh, with it. And so Tally was bleeding pretty bad. His wife insisted that he go back to the house and they called a doctor. Um, so doctors went to both houses. Hamby was pronounced dead. Tally was, was pronounced as near death. Um, but Hamby's insisted that the uh, that that the sheriff swear out a warrant against Tally for murder, and so then in February of 1886 there was a trial, and uh, United States Senator Gray, um, who was one of the senators who managed to get into the Senate during all that wrangling with gas addicts, um, he was uh, he represented uh, Tally as his defense attorney, um, and they brought Tally into the uh, to the courtroom down in Newcastle um, on basically a chased lounge and he basically was bandaged on his head and he was in and out of consciousness never would would stand in a courtroom today because clearly he wasn't able to participate in his own defense um, they even determined among themselves that his widow or his wife uh, was too distraught to testify um, and so they didn't let her testify either they did however allow uh, Walter Lockwood to testify who was an 18 year old African American. And he was one of the first, it was one of the first times that they allowed testimony of an African American in a trial uh, for a capital trial for, against a white um, uh, American. Uh, in this case, he backed everything up that Tally said, and they really didn't have anything other than Joseph Hanby's testimony, the father of John Wesley. Um, now, Stories have it that the caps were too big on his on his uh, 
shotgun that his brother had warned him the night before that he needed to pinch them so that they wouldn't fall off in the cold weather. Uh, the other family stories are that his wife, knowing that there would be trouble, had wet the powder in his shotgun. Either could have happened. Um, I will say whether it happened or not, they kind of ostracized her uh, and took the children and raised them. The grandparents took the children and raised them and she, she did not raise her children. Uh, John Wesley had three young children at the time when he was killed. Uh, but that is the, the uh, Hamby Tally feud of 1886. Thank you. Yep. Yes, I see Ken and Rosina. You guys can unmute. Hey there. Ken and Rosanna, question. jump in. There you go. Hey, well, I think you should write a mini series. <laughs> sorry or it could be like another hamilton playwright because there's so much drama here Absolutely. but there's, there's a couple of things john i want to like interject here because james james did i say john i'm sorry i'm sorry because it's so exciting to hear this um okay so my father at one point had owned the um the house that the the house next door to the mall Okay. The Dunning. The, yeah, the, Dunning, the Lombardi house. Lombardi. And he, sure. His dream was actually in those days, because he actually bought the house on Falk Road, Old Colonial Village, which was, I forget which house. It he, was the Tally's owned the, up there where Old Colonial Village was. Old Colonial Village. So so yeah. he didn't want to see these houses destroyed. Sure. So he preserved the house and try, you know, would try to build around it because he knew that somebody would just tear it down. So that was his dream. But but this is a weird thing because my mother was an antique dealer and I have deeds here from Grubb and John Falk, mm -hmm. 1800s yep. and deeds from Gorby, Jordan, Isaac Grubb and Samuel Jordan, mm -hmm. deeds from Nick Lynn, John Falk. These are all going back to the 1800s. Right tried to give these to the historic society and they never called me back well i'll call you back in a heartbeat and yeah you, these, these, you guys, you guys they, should talk they're they're all interrelated I, I will interject one thing about um falk when you go back to the original falk it's in judge clayton's book um he was instrumental in helping build the prison at the courthouse down in newcastle and after the prison had been in operation a couple of years one of the prisoners uh, somebody smuggled in a hacksaw and he sawed the bars out of the window in the prison. And so the commissioners down in Newcastle uh, took estimates on, on how to fix it. And everybody seemed to agree. The bars had been, when the, when the wall was being built, the, bar, the bars had been put into both the sill and the, both sills, top and bottom, and then the wall was built, finished around it. And so all the contractors down there agreed at the very least you had to take out the top sill in order to do this. And it was gonna be a rather extensive period of time. It was gonna be about $130, which is a lot of money back in the 1820s, 1830s um, or 1720s or 30s. And uh, so John Falk went down there and he told him he'd do it for free if they would just pay for the, um, the blacksmith's job. And so he, got the, the rem remnants of the uh, old bars out, went and cut new bars the right length, got the blacksmith to take his portable forge down there and they heated the new bars up and bent them so that they could get them into the holes. And then with a couple strokes of his hammer straightened them out and they were as good as new. He threw some cold water on them and it, they cost him about eight bucks for the blacksmith. Mm -hmm. So here's a map. I don't know if you can see it. I don't know if it's backwards or not. It might be. It might be showing backwards. Go closer. But you see the. Yeah, it's I mean, really it's hard to see with. Well, yeah, I know, but I mean, these, these but, are pretty cool. So I'd like to, you know, put them on record somewhere. Down, there. Give it to me. Yeah. This is. I the, would love to to see them in person and and take a look at. Like I say, they all are interrelated. Great. Yeah. Well, D can set up a breakfast for us. There you or go. A, or a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> All Any right. Any other questions? Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Just sharing. These are indentures. Oh, that's awesome, you guys. Yeah, you definitely have to connect on that. And I think Dave somewhere. I don't see Dave. Oh, Dave, you have your hand up or not anymore? Uh, I, no, I'll, I'll, I'll wait because I've already asked one and there's somebody behind me just raised it in. All right. Jay Harry, I think you're up. There you go. Yeah, I was wondering about that first picture that you showed of the children and uh, adults in front of the Forwood School. Mm -hmm. It looked like there might be a black child in the front row. Could that be? Yeah, we have looked at that picture over and over again to try to determine whether it was just angle, camera angle or whether they just uh, allowed the child to attend without saying anything. Um, there is more than one um, record of that, suggestion of that at the um, Claymont Stone School prior to 1952. And that's a whole nother topic that would be an interesting thing, a project that I'm involved in with the Claymont 12 right now uh, with that whole discussion. And certainly with the folks in Arden, um, I would love to talk with them because they, they have a part to play or a story to tell in that. Um, because even after the attorney general told Arden they couldn't integrate, they went ahead and did it anyway. Um, because the younger siblings of the children that were going to Claymont were in Arden. Um, and so they allowed them to go. Um, one of the, uh, Marion Anderson was actually at the White House um, with the executive director from the Claymont Community Center when uh, President Biden signed the new bill uh, recognizing Claymont as one of the important um, landmarks in Brown versus Board of Education because people don't realize even here in Delaware that that Delaware case was the only case that was decided in favor of integration. And uh, the chancellor really um, figured out a way to, to, to slice hairs on that because he said he could not overturn Plessy versus Ferguson because that was the law of the land separate but equal but he could in fact find that there was no way that they could make uh, Claymont and the school in Hocassen um, equal. And therefore if separate and equal is the law, then the kids got to go to the other school because there's no way that they could make it without continuing to damage those kids. Um, if they had to wait a year or two or three or whatever for the school to get up to the same uh, equality as the white school. And so he really found a way to get around it and the Delaware decision was the only decision upheld by Brown by the Supreme Court and Brown versus Board of Education. All of the others were for segregation and they were all overturned. So Delaware um, has a big role to play in that. And this September, uh, September 4th, will be the 70th anniversary um, of the Claymont Board saying, let those kids in. They, they voted the night of the third to let those kids in on the fourth. Um, and then uh, Arden followed suit even though the AG said it didn't apply to them, they, they went ahead and did it anyway. Thank you for that. Um, that jogs my memory and, and causes me to say that I don't think enough is made of Anthony, the black Swede from much earlier, who appears, I believe if memory serves, appears in the early um, records for about 25 or 30 years uh, and was the right-hand man of Governor Johann Prince at one point. So right. I think we have quite a heritage from the very get-go. It was uh, Swedes, Finns, Dutch, Germans, and Anthony the Black Swede. Exactly. So Schneiders, you have your hand up? Hey there, I'll hey. try to be brief. Laugh, laugh. Um, a couple of modern questions. We live in Webster Farm. So I was wondering if you could com comment on, there's a uh, resident on Marsh who um, said he's descended from or is part of the Webster Farm family. Plus Highland Orchards, I believe their farm is also connected somehow. It is. One question. Second mm -hmm. question. Marsh Road, where does its name come from? Third question, um, have you published? And then fourth comment, it looked to me like there was a little black boy and a little black girl and a black person in the background up against the schoolhouse in that picture. 
forward. So I'll shut up now. Yeah, and like I say, that has been something that we've kind of kicked around and looking at that picture and trying to determine whether that was a camera angle and sunshade or, or what that was. Um, there's no documentary uh, discussion of that. There is with Claymont, but um, not not with forward, but certainly if we can come across it, then that certainly moves us back that much further into the 1800s where on a local level, at least, we were willing to say, these kids are kids, they deserve to be educated the same as anybody else. Um, and so if if they let them attend forward with on kind of a wink and a nod, then that that's great for our ancestors that were there. Um, with regard to the Websters, um, they pretty much all descend, the original Delaware Websters descend from Thomas Webster um, and um, his wife, uh, Margaret Clark. Um, they are uh, my six great grandparents. Um, the farm <laughs> there um, that you're referring to across from Brandywine High School um, is, a, is part of the original Webster uh, plot, as is obviously Webster Farms that, that you live in. Um, several of his children married Handys. If you ever go into the narthex at Chester Bethel Church, the original deed, um, which sets up the original nine trustees, are two Hambys who married Webster girls and Thomas Webster. So three of the nine <laughs> were uh, interrelated. Um, but uh, yeah, the Websters intermarried with, with everybody. Uh, Thomas Webster is buried in the old cemetery at Chester Bethel. Um, years ago, uh, when I joined the Sons of the American Revolution, um, and I decided I wanted to make sure that there was a uh, SAR marker on Thomas's grave. And so we had a ceremony there and uh, the one of the people who came and spoke um, was the recently deceased uh, Ruth Ann Minner, who came and, and ah. helped dedicate the marker that day. Um, so we were pleased to have her. She was lieutenant governor at that time. But uh, so, yeah, the Websters intermarried with with uh, everybody that you could think of pretty much <laughs> through the years. He had he only had one girl or one boy and the rest were all girls. And so, it, you know, Clark Webster, his son, did a good job of keeping the Webster name going because it was all on him. Um, <laughs> but because everybody else married into, you know, the Hambies or the Tallies. Marsh, and the Marsh versus Hayward. Uh, well, the Marsh Road on the old maps, on some of the old maps, it refers to it as a hay road. The reason for it, either Marsh or Hay, is because the farmers up here in Brandywine 100 wanted to use their uh, land for the best, highest, most benefit, which was growing crops, or just in general having, uh, you know, cows, horses, whatever. So they would run their cows down to the marsh, which is, you know, down where all of the, uh, you wouldn't want to feed anything down there now, <laughs> but you know, we're all like the uh, Edgemore plant and such. So they would oh, grow okay. hay down there. Um, to uh, to feed the cows. Now, some of them they would they would actually send the cows down, and then the cows would come home at the end of the day. Cows are amazingly smart animals. I I watched them over at Upper Chai, uh, at, the, at the original at our Hamby farm over there, when my great uncles would they'd open the door, the cows would come in on their own. They didn't have to be chased in. They found their stall, not any stall, their stall. Um, so cows are much smarter than people give give them credit for, but they would let them out. They go to the, the marsh, then in the, in the evening, they come home and they'd be milked. Interesting. Publish? Um, I have not. I have kicked around, you know, with the 8,000 other things I got going on. <laughs> um, still just as a beast, you know. Yeah. Once in a while, I have to do a day job. Um, <laughs> if, if, uh, if I win the Powerball and I could concentrate on this kind of stuff all the time, then yeah, we would I, I really wanted to take Barbara McEwing's Neighbors of the Great Valley Turnpike and expand on it because, I mean, I love it. I've used it for much research, but the reality is Thanks to her too. she made a bunch of copies of the information was down at the Historical Society of Bible yeah, Records the local books. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that sort of stuff um, versus kind of more of the stories, if anybody has seen one of the, the, the tally books that was published in 1898, um, there's a lot of little snippets that I would like to include about the people rather than just saying so-and-so was born and died and had six children and so forth. So that takes more of a 
undertaking to pull all that kind of stuff together. Um, and you can do it even with the generations now, although it's getting harder because now when they charge for obituaries, you don't hardly get anything on an obituary. Mm -hmm. Used to be you got some amazing detail out of obituaries about the people's life, about their family. And, and sometimes you would get things just in passing because a widow would be staying with a daughter and you wouldn't even have known what the daughter's name was, but it mm -hmm. mentions her in the obituary because her mom had moved in after her dad died. And so you get that additional link. Mm -hmm. You get children from the next generation that you can follow up on. Um, now the standard news journal obit is six, um, uh, six lines unless you want to pay. Uh, when right. my grandmother died in 2004, um, I had written her obituary and it was the full column from top to bottom, but that was almost $2,000 to get the news journal to print that. And um, I'm sorry, I'll shut up now. The Great Valley Turnpike or whatever you called it, yeah, is that 202? Yes. Yeah. Cool. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, I still have a couple of copies left. That when I, I took them to uh, Sprint Printing and they were able to... I. I didn't use my copy because my grandmother had it originally and then I had it and we had both written extensive notes in it. Um, but I was able to acquire a copy off of um, eBay or someplace that was pristine and didn't have any notes in it. And so we were able to deconstruct it and then they were able to reproduce it. I also had, um, before Barbara died, she had given all of the stuff that's in it to another one of my cousins who gave it to me. And so on some of those things, we were able to kind of enhance the pictures rather than just copying them because I had the original that was used for the layout um, when uh, Smalls Printing actually printed the originals, but they're, they're no longer in business. Bonnie? Yes, um, I would like to know more about the Tally Folk Cemetery. And is that the folk house just up past the um, where the townhouses are on the same side? It, it's kind of sideways to Folk Road. You're talking about that's within the townhouses, like in in the circle of townhouses. Yes, that's that's one of the original tally houses. The, okay. The tally the tally Falk burying ground only becomes a Falk burying ground because um, William Tally, who bought that land about 200 acres along that side of the street. Um, one of his daughters married John Falk, and then that's how it ended up moving in because he had set his other children up with other farms elsewhere. And so it just became, that's how it became the Tally Falk bearing ground because that was, it was originally Tally ground. Um, we, uh, thanks to, again, to, to Dee and, and to uh, John Cartier, we were able to get the taxes removed because somewhere along the way back in 1994 or so, um, somebody at the county flipped the switch and started charging it taxes again, even though it was clearly a cemetery. Um, and so that has been removed and it is, you know, denoted as such there. So there's no taxes that are charged anymore. And they, they removed the 4,000 or so taxes that had accumulated over all those years, plus the penalties and stuff. Um, we are working to, uh, the former uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court actually is a um, partner when he retired, not the most recent one, but the one before him, um, is a partner in the law firm that handled the estate of Lawrence Talley, who was the one, the last one really to take care of it. After Lawrence died, the people who owned the house there, which is now Foshi Photography, just kind of took care of Lawrence removed the stones because he was old and it was hard to get around the stones. And so Lawrence piled them over on the side there. Um, but the folks who owned the house just kept mowing it and just taking care of it. Um, now, since that time, when, when the Fossies bought it and moved the photography thing there, they put up a wall and a garage back there on their property, but they basically have ignored it, which has allowed it to grow up. Um, and so we are hoping to be able to um, create um, a group of descendants who wish to take on that. And there was, I need to get access to Lawrence Talley's estate, um, which I'll need to go to Chantry Court to get them to authorize the law firm to release their records. Their records do exist. The Chief Justice went back and had them pulled from Iron Mountain. There's 
a bunch of research there. And so that's our next step is we're gonna get that clearance and get all those documents. Um, there was some money that was set aside. I'd like to know what happened to it. Is it in unclaimed Delaware funds because nobody did anything with it for three plus years? Um, because Lawrence did leave some money in his will for the upkeep of it. Um, so all those questions are ones that we want to track down. There are two surveys that were done, um, one by the WPA and I wanna say 37. Um, the other one was done by um, the folks who used to live there at the corner before it was a mobile station, before it was a little shopping center. Um, and they wrote down the stones that they could see at whatever, whatever time it was. And I fuzzy on when, when that was that they did it. So there's two. And then in the tally book, it talks about the cemetery and talks about some of the earliest burials. And so I think that we can come pretty close to knowing who's buried there. With the WPA one, we could come close to knowing where some of, at least the stones that were legible in 37, so we could figure out where people are. Um, but I think that ultimately it will be kind of like a, a brass plaque type thing, much like they attach to the wall of the Grub Cemetery in Arden that basically says, these are all the people we know who were buried here kind of thing. Um, and then of course, to cut down all the trees and hopefully to partner with the Fashis to allow us access. It is landlocked. Um, Dee and John and I were out there and walked it. Um, there, there is no technical access to the parcel, which complicates matters. You have to kind of play nice with the neighbors to try to get somebody to work with you. Um, so one way would be, the easiest way would be for the Fashis to allow us to. Now, Rudy Fashi, who um, is up there in years now, if he hasn't passed away, um, originally, his idea was, well, just dig everybody up and move them because he wanted a half acre or a quarter acre or whatever. He just, he just wanted the land, which I think is why they put the fence up. The problem with them putting the fence up is they have some groundskeeping people who I think store stuff there. And what they do a lot of times is they dump stuff out of their um, truck there. So when Dee and John and I were there, there was quite a lot of stuff that had literally been dumped. It was not stuff that was there because it had overgrown. It was stuff that just been trashed there. So really trying to partner with them, hopefully um, to find a solution that allows us to honor our ancestors um, and you know doesn't impinge on, on their ability to use their property the way that they want to, but it's a work in progress. Thank you. There was an easement across the other property. I don't know of any easement. I'll see if I can find it and I'll send it to you. Okay. I will put my email in the chat. So if anybody wants to send. Well, I figure out how to do the chat with all these people here. You would think there would be an easement. I, you know, I know they don't like landlocked parcels. So, well, yeah, but keep in mind how this was created. It was, <laughs> it wasn't like it was. I mean, it was just there, and it was up to the descendants to care for. And it's mentioned in several deeds, basically instructing the next generation. The problem is the next generation sold off all the land around it and didn't, didn't, uh, didn't do that. So, um, anyway. I will put my email there. Chat. Any other questions for James? Um, just one. This is Bob Daly. Go hey, ahead, Bob. Bob. When when Ann and I and Cindy Davis um, went over to see the Tally Falk Cemetery, the little parcel you're talking about there near Fashi Photo. Um, we walked into the woods, I think it was during the winter, so it wasn't so leafy and full of ticks and everything. And um, there's a pile of headstones. Yeah. Keep that a secret, Bob. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we don't, I don't want them to disappear. Yeah, yeah. I, they, they are. Yeah, they're, they're the ones that, that Lawrence Talley moved, but yeah. Okay. Everybody hey, forget you heard that or don't pass it on to anybody. Hey, John, is there a, a map of that cemetery anywhere? Wow. There's, like I say, there's not a specific map. There's the layout of it when the WPA did their did their survey. So mm -hmm. with that, you have everything that was um, readable in 37 or 38 when they did it. So they they did it laid out. 
the other one that the folks that lived at the corner, they just basically went over there and wrote down everybody they could read. So it's not, it's kind of hit or miss. It's not a, a map per se, but with the WPA one, you, you kind of have an idea of where they were um, and what's readable. And if you combine the two and the tally book and group families together, you could probably figure out some of the missing ones that either didn't have stones or the stone is unreadable by the time they got around to trying to record it. Um, some of the stones have disappeared over the years, um, but there are uh, quite a few that are still there. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Gail and Fred, you have your hand up. Um, circling back to the publish question, but a different approach. Uh, Gail and I are both founding board members of Friends of Forward Preserve Park, which used to be called the Allen Tract. Right. And you wrote a beautiful piece that we used as part of our initial discussion about the history and the heritage and why it became Forward Preserve Park. I'm wondering, have you put up or could you consider putting up something like a website, a collection of something that you could just throw that stuff against the wall and just say, here it is. If anybody wants to put it together, um, please help. Sure. I mean, we, we could. I, I actually have a Facebook page that I started when, when we started the, with the pandemic that I just called Hamby History Tour. And I was just going around and, and doing videos and talking about um, different places. Um, it becomes a labor intensive thing. And every time I posted one, I was getting 18 or 20 emails about, well, come do this and come do that. And <laughs> again, sometimes I have a full-time job that I legitimately have to go to. Um, but yeah, there certainly is a lot of stuff. And if somebody was interested in, in helping with that, um, you know, a lot, it, it takes a lot of digging to pull the things together. The thing that I pulled together for you guys for that took a lot of digging through both the forward and the grub um, histories that I have and the historical society and online stuff um, to be able to um, pull all of those threads together. Um, and it, it helps sometimes when it's somebody who's who's got all those different threads to be able to know when they see something that, hey, that matches with this and how the families interact versus um, you know, somebody who might not know the, the history and, and read something and not see anything of significance in it. Um, and so that's where it comes down to you know, finding the right person that, that is willing to, to do all that digging and, and back storing it to figure it out. Um, just, just, yeah. a, just a thought. Um, yeah. Are you volunteering? I'm, I'm pointing in a direction that would, would help you. Um, okay, so I only got on Facebook because I've got three daughters and I've got two grandkids, and the, it was the only way to keep track of them. Sure. And now, now they just Snapchat us, and I actually never look at Facebook. Right. However, if you go to Costco or wherever, you can pick up a five, eight gig, a terabyte drive, and just dump stuff on it, and just build build a library of things you reflected things you've captured sure don't don't publish it anywhere because there are all kinds of wackos out there who will give you grief and who needs that crap but <laughs> if you if you could assemble it i'll bet you somewhere here in brandy 100 we could find some interesting people and i'd be happy to participate but we could find some interesting people who are competent at right interested in doing that and offload a big hunk of the burden from you sure um but I mean, you've developed a lot of wisdoms that um, deserve to be loved. And thank well, you for what you do. Oh, you're welcome. People, people are very interested in the history of Brainy 100. And it's people who are descendants of the history that are interested in it. But I also find lots of people who have moved here who are just as interested in it because they moved here because of the DuPont company or, or something. They say, well, what's this thing with Tallyville or what's this thing with Grub Road or, you know, what do these things mean? Why was there such a big deal when they wanted to rename Hamby School and why was there a big fight over it being Joe Biden or Brandywood or Hamby? <laughs> um, um, and so, uh, you know, and I'll point out that's the only election Joe Biden's ever lost in Delaware, but... <laughs> 
when when in the past we we had some some public uh, things we did uh, at the Newcastle County Library there at Tally Day Park and we did it at Brandywine High School, um, the turnout of people who wanted to come and hear was tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly those sort of things could be organized as part of this um, historical society and have different people. We had different people throughout the day. The, the second one we had at Brandywine where, you know, we had one of my distant cousins who's done an extensive, published a book on the Grubb family. And he came and talked about the Grubbs and we had some others talk about different families. And so you could have that, you know, and have a, a slate of speakers and have somebody talking about the Claymont Stone School and talking about uh, Newark Union and talking about um, Ivyside, talking about um, uh, the, the Hanby Trust, um, all those type things people um, are very, very interested in um, because they pass by those things all the time and they say, well, what's that? The house next to the, the church in the YMCA on Mount Lebanon Road that we've fought to try to keep up uh, is an old tally house from about 1813. Um, you know, all these things sit there um, somewhat neglected until somebody buys them and decides that they want to uh, tear them down. So Ed, please consider my suggestion. Absolutely. Uh, in your spare time, just throw everything in one big pile. And at some point, you will get help. <laughs> yeah, the, the trick for me is, is converting them to electronic. I, I'm not the best electronic person. I have to get my tech person on that. If I wasn't using a fake background, you could see my piles, <laughs> which, which are very hardcore piles. If there was ever a fire, we'd have a problem. Oh, um, but well, James, I'm thinking that maybe we need to get like a Delaware Humanities grant or something to pay someone to help, you know, pull this stuff together or help you or help all of us or whatever, just kind yeah, of wrangle I mean, a lot of this stuff. It's one of those things where, you know, you have stuff and you might not even realize what you have. It wasn't that long ago that, that a researcher at the University of Delaware uh, came across the letter from President Jefferson to the folks down there uh, on the Elk Neck. Cool. Um, and it's been in the archives of the special collections at the University of Delaware for probably 150 years. And, and just don't let Google scarf it up. Yes. Keep the IP. Right. Anything yeah. else? Anything else out there? Any other questions, comments? Chris, if you're still there, I might put you on the spot just to say a brief word. I mentioned earlier about Ivy Side. I don't know if you want to just uh, mention about the grant that we got put into Chris Coons's office. Yeah, so uh, Councilman Cartier, who uh, wasn't able to join us tonight, but uh, loves Brandy 100 history. Uh, was having, uh, was doing a tour of the Claymont area and then had sat down and have lunch with uh, Senator Chris Coons, who used to be the uh, county council president before he was the county executive and still has a special place in his heart for historic preservation. And uh, the Ivy Side House is inside Bechtel Park, which is a county owned park and is in horrible condition and it's deteriorating it they did a lot to seal it and uh you know keep it from worsening but um vandals uh and squatters still go inside and so um it's seen better days and when they were discussing that uh chris coon said well i have earmarks uh and you can apply for an earmark which is a senator's special prerogative to get money directly out of the federal budget. So we put together an application uh, basically to ask Senator Coons to make the uh, Ivy Side House one of those earmark requests that gets added into, hopefully, into the federal budget. And it was a $4.5 million request. It's the main building plus all the outbuildings. And the idea is to bring it up to not, not just preserve it, but actually use it as a place to house AmeriCorps volunteers, which is another priority item for the state and the county, a place to put the AmeriCorps volunteers. So it serves both purposes. And um, we sent that up uh, just in the nick of time underneath the deadline. 
and we're waiting to hear its progress to see how it's uh, how it's fared in the selection process. I thought Chris is being modest because he he threw that grant request together in about 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, the, I think the deadline had actually passed, but Chris Coons's office allowed us to get it in late, maybe a day or two late. So that was awesome. Yeah, but we, had a lot of, we had a lot of uh, support from a lot of the uh, local um, the, the state reps and state senators, and uh, we, we had a lot of letters of support, which was wonderful. Yeah, that's great. So maybe maybe when this group meets next month, maybe we'll have some news by then. I don't know. It's kind of a long shot, but you know, uh, you never know. And, and we have to start asking because um, for those of you who know the County Historic Review Board, which met last week, um, county doesn't have such a great track record of necessarily maintaining all of its historic resources. And, and they were before the HRB last week for a demolition permit to tear down a building down south of the canal, a very historic property. So uh, we don't want that to happen to Ivy Side and want to do what we can to help raise the money to do what's needed to put it back into use because, you know, other, other, an empty building is, is not a healthy building. Right. So you need need people there to keep it, you know, keep an eye on it, keep it alive and being used and whatnot. So anyway, hopefully good news in the future. And if not, we'll keep trying, I think, till we get get the funds from somewhere. Yeah, it's so. really one of the the worst examples of <laughs> neglect, um, particularly in our area, but uh, the, of the county, because uh, when you mentioned about outbuildings. I'm not sure what outbuildings remain, but there was a heck of a lot more there when the county got the property in 1983 or 84 when the Bechtels turned it over. Um, and uh, during my time on the Historic Review Board and since then they have, it's been a succession of neglect and demolition of, of pretty much all of those things. Uh, one of the barns out back there had boards that were rescued from the uh, Philadelphia Exposition in 1876 and were stamped with 1876. It was one of the big barns that was built for our uh, centennial. And, um, you know, they went to the county dump. Well, thanks, Chris, for the update. Dave, I see your hands up. It seems I saw a story somewhere recently about a, uh, an old house on Falk Road, someplace not far from Stanley's Tavern, that was probably going to get torn down and developed. Um, there's, uh, I, I'm sorry to put on to get onto a sad story here, but is it, is it, uh, is that is there any hope for saving that place? Would that be Jester, maybe, James? No, he's talking about the one we were going back and forth over. It's the one where they built the McMansion and waited 15 years to decide they want to tear down the historic. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know that. It does. It, it yeah. was on the uh, Newcastle County demol or yeah, it demolition. Yeah, it was at the HRB, that same meeting. Right. Yeah. Um, we will know. Sorry. I was just going to say, unfortunately, the way that the county code is written currently, there's not absent convincing the owner that you that it's in his or her best interest to do it. There's not a whole lot. Um, it's not historically zoned, which is the only thing that allows the county to say no if it has the H zone. Um, which is why we need to, you know, encourage folks. D has success in getting the first um, private landowner to ask for the H zone. They had a, a uh, uh, presentation um, for that um, there uh, across from uh, what is it there on Silverside Road, mm. the pool, um, a couple of years ago um, during the pandemic. But you know, we need to, you know, put that out there and encourage folks who have historic properties who care about them and say, hey, you're not gonna be here forever. And the people who come after you might not care about this as much as you do. So why don't you go through the proactive rezoning process and get an H zone put on your house? Do something for future generations so that we can ensure that the history is preserved in the way that you care for it today. Yeah, absolutely. Right now the county code only, uh, so Dave, that the decision on that hearing left from last week will be heard in three weeks about what the HRB decides about that house that the owner put in a demolition request. Um, but as James said, the, the uh, worst case scenario, best case scenario, I'm not sure which, 
is the, the only thing the HRB can do at most is delay them for nine months uh, for the demolition and then, then they can tear it down. So uh, unless like James said, it's put under historic overlay, which for that property, it's too late at this point, but right. uh, presumably unless, unless we have a way of convincing the property owner to do otherwise, but. And they have a differing interpretation of how they do things than when <laughs> we were on the board or when I was on the board. Um, when I was on the board, we discussed every property that was being held every month unless there was nothing to say about it. Mm. Kind of kept it in the forefront. Now you have a you have the the meeting where it's discussed and and the the applicant makes a makes their case for why they want to de demolish it. Members of the community can speak as to why it shouldn't be demolished. Then they have this business meeting that they announce whether they're going to hold it or not hold it. But after that, it kind of falls off the radar. And it just sits there until the nine months are up, and then the guy can get his his demolition permit and move on, or, or woman, or whatever. And you know, um, we have had success in talking with folks. Um, unfortunately, not at this late stage where he's already built a McMansion behind it, which is really too close to it. But um, the Clay Estates off of Wilson Road, you know, we met with the Tally Brothers, who who their aunt left it to them. Um, and we met with the Tally Brothers and their developer when I was on the historic review board. And we said, look, we'll give you selective demolition. You can tear down all the non factors, all the things that don't contribute to this beautiful um, two story real colonial stone house. And we'll go to bat with you at the uh, um, planning board for variances to bring this house up to the same square footage and without having to move it, because that was the problem, was where it was. So, you know, we'll get you setbacks, we'll go to bat for you and everything. And in the end, that house is the showplace of Clay Estates. If you go up there and look, it's the showplace of all of this. So much of the fact that the developer bought it for himself. He didn't even put it on the market. <laughs> um, and, you know, that, so success can be had. Um, we fought John Rollins for years over the Mousley Farm, and now it's the, you know, community center for that uh, age-restricted community up there. Um, Good. Which, so we uh, have to speak up. Yeah. Which... Uh, which one of your relatives was it who lived in Phil Cloutier's old house that got torn down? That was a beautiful building. Oh, you're talking about that. That's uh, that was in the Weldon family. But when uh, Eva Weldon married Philip Husbands, um, who was my great grandfather's first cousin, uh, they they moved in there. And and Philip actually had one of the first private elevators in a private home. I think other than a Dupont estate. Um, because she had a de degenerative bone disease and couldn't get from one floor to the other without assistance. And he had an elevator installed in that house. Um, but yeah, we fought Del Dot. Del Dot played a little dirty pool with that one. Um, we, we had some money from the area legislators to move it over there by the Blue Ball Barn um, or over by there's some other historic homes um, and kind of have a little complex. Um, but uh, Del Dot inflated the, the cost because they included all of the cost of that intersection in that project. And we said, wait a minute, you're gonna do the project anyway. The only cost that should be involved is the cost of removing the house. Um, but when they, when they put their actual estimates in, of course, the General Assembly backed off of their support when it was about four times what they had agreed to set aside. Huh. So it went to the trash heap. Oh, um, Cindy asked a question in the chat, James, can, it, for the title of the your cousin's book about the Grubb family. Yeah, I I sent her a message. She sent okay. a message. I, I have yeah, to, I don't have uh, that. Thank you, Dee. Right I sent I sent James an email. Thank okay. you. Okay. I, I don't have that one sitting right in front of me to, <laughs> to get the actual title of what it is. It's David Grubb that wrote it, but um, I'll have to dig it out of the the pile. In the I appreciate room. it. Thank you, James. Okay. Yep, no problem, Cindy. Okay. Would you be, uh, James, would you be likely to know uh, about uh, an old house along the Brandywine River, not far from the old president's grave in uh, in the Wilmington Brandywine Cemetery, or is that Shipley rather than Hamby down there? <laughs> um, it's definitely not Hamby's that live down there anyway, but I, I, I'm familiar with the, the, you're talking about John McKinley's grave or James McKinley? Yeah, grave. yeah. First I was foreign the... born governor, first and only foreign, uh, foreign born governor of Delaware. Yeah. <laughs> he was relocated out of Wilmington down there to the bottom of the Wilmington Brandywine Cemetery when they were building the library. Yeah. Well, there was a, if you, the best way I can describe it is if you're, if you're, uh, if you're up outbound on Pennsylvania Avenue, just about to, passing the cemetery, just about to get on 95 North, 
if you make a hard right and go straight down the hill into that uh, that Happy Valley community, all the way at the bottom of that hill on the left, there used to stand a frame house that had real wide clapboards on it. And I never knocked on the door to find out whose it was, but it was uh, it looked really old. And I just didn't know if there's a shot in the dark. I wondered if you knew anything about that building. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, um, unfortunately. All right. All right. Fred and Gail, you have a last question? Anything else on the Murphy House? I, it sounds like another one of the same story you just talked about, and AI Nemours wanted to kill it, and they did. Uh, uh, but any yeah. inside talk on it? Well, it, again, that's another one where Del Dot directly sold us out. Uh, I was on the historic review board at that time. Um, Del Dot had paved within a foot and a half of the front porch um, without obtaining the property from Alzar. And I was in a meeting in Dover in Del Dot's headquarters with Ann Camby when she was Secretary of Transportation. And she didn't know that they had done that. And so as soon as that came up, um, they were ready to deal. And so we executed an agreement that they would transfer it to Nemours. Um, and that uh, there would be deed restrictions attached that Del Dot would enforce, and that later turned out to be our mistake. Um, and Nemours was given, at the time that they took possession of the property, uh, the estimate for how much Del Dot had already gotten from a professional architect to restore the property. Um, they sat on it for a number of years. And then they realized that when they went to a smoke-free campus, that all of their doctors and nurses were going over and standing on the porch to smoke. So it became an attractive nuisance to them. Um, and so then they came and they went to Del Dot and asked for them to remove the deed restrictions so they could apply for a demolition permit and tear it down, claiming that it cost too much. Well, their own estimates were about $100,000 less than Del Dot had told them it would cost 10 years before that. So it just didn't make any sense, particularly since they just spent $37 million on the mansion. Um, so yes, it went down and, and they have their open space there that they can do what they want with. And they, they managed to acquire an acre in Brandy 100 for a little or nothing. Yeah, that was a tragedy. I, so I'm not sure lesson, if it's still, the, sorry. The lesson to be heard there is that, you know, if you're in that cir circumstance and you, you know, the, what we would have known as the board now is, you know, don't trust another agency of government to uh, be the, the conservatory of the uh, deed restrictions, put CCOBH or something, some kind of public body in charge of enforcing those. Um, you know, that's the only reason that the house there down from the YMCA is still standing is because Woodlawn had deed restrictions that said you can't change the external uh, parts of the house without their approval. And then um, in negotiating with uh, Bob Valhar and Woodlawn, they transferred the enforcement of those deed restrictions to CCOBH. Mm -hmm. But that's the only reason it's still standing because they wanted to tear it down and build two houses there. Yeah, exactly. The, so, that third party makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Lessons mm -hmm. learned. Yeah. yeah. I th I'm not sure if it's still active, but there used to be a Facebook page for the Murphy House. Um, um, yeah, um, what's that Larry Hoover started. Yeah, Larry so Hoover, if anyone's yeah. interested in the like historic pictures and what happened there, there's a pa Facebook page. Yep. Well, if it's still active. We were on the board of Delaware Greenways then, and mm. we made a desperate last attempt to get it saved, but it was obvious it was it, it just was going down. When when we when Alzar transferred it to Del Dot before they transferred it to the, the hospital. Um, they spent $50,000 on the property at our request to put in vents and to put in fans yeah. so that it would stay dry. They mm. put an attic fan and everything to keep pulling the moisture out. And then they put in the proper vents in the windows so they could board it up, but keep air moving. And the first thing that the hospital did was they disconnected the power and disconnected the fans. Huh. We found out that later, but that was, yeah. Because then they said, oh, it's, it's got water damage and it's mold and mildew and everything. Well, how did that happen? You had a perfect fan system operating. Somehow Bird Husband survived and became Greenway's home. But, uh... Well, and that's where we hope to have moved the Weldon Husband's house over there, either at the barn or over where the Bird Husband's house and the other is and using it in conjunction, much like Delaware Greenway's uses that house. And it's that was part of the Section 106 uh, sort of negotiating process when the whole blue ball Right. Barn complex was, you know, being decided and AstraZeneca was expanding and 
Um, so we got that as a concession that that house would be preserved. But nobody but. knows about Alzar today. If you go search <laughs> Alzar, you find hardly anything because they're pre pre internet, whatever. They're a shadowy group that DuPont created. Well, folks, thank you for what you've done. Yeah. What you're doing. And I know we, I think we could have James on like every other month for a couple of years and we probably still wouldn't exhaust his knowledge of the area. It's just, it just amazes me anytime I hear him talk about Brandywine 100 and his, uh, the way he remembers dates and names and people and the stories and everything. So, James, thanks so much for talking <laughs> with us tonight, sharing with that us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I know it's it's kind of much later than um, I mean, I don't know. I didn't necessarily mean to keep everyone this long, but does anyone else have anything else to bring up or we can go make coffee and keep on. I, I've got one more house question if he's not too tired. Uh, it's up to James. <laughs> go ahead. Well, um, I'm remembering the original Riverside Hospital building. I think it was the original one. It sat across the Edgemoor Elementary School playground from the school. And it sort of looked out over the Brandywine over, uh, not the Brandywine, out, out toward the Delaware River, you know, near Edgemoor there. Um, I just wondered if you knew anything about the original owners of that place. I think there's still a gatehouse and a wall or two, but the building's, you know, long, long gone. I'm not familiar with precisely where you're talking about. I'd have to go out there and look. Yeah. Not, yeah. You're not talking about the old seller's estate. You're talking... No, it, no it, that's, it, that's what he's talking about. Good. Is that what he's talking about? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I was trying to picture it in my mind, but there is a uh, there is an old house in the back back there, which there was some noise about maybe the the uh, people who own the condominiums there wanting to tear down, but then they, they kind of backed off of it, but it is sitting vacant right now. Hmm. Wow. Well, thank you. Uh, I should have known that. <laughs> the house was built by William Sellers, who was... Uh, operated the Edgemore Ironworks. And what was now Paladin it was originally Clifton Park. That was his estate. And the roads that go through there were the roads on the estate. Yeah. Well, now this the old- Actually, if there used to be, I guess, a, a entrance at the back. There's a gate there, um, yeah. which where the bowling lanes are, mm -hmm. um, that, that you could go out back that way. Um, but the residents back there are keenly interested in, in um, in keeping it, um, Bob Valhara had reached out to me to ask if I would, when it looked like they were going to go for demolition, if I would jump into it. But then they they backed off of that. So it's like I say, it's it's empty, and it needs work, um, but it, it still is there. It's great. Yeah. I by the way, um, I don't know if you can say anything about it, but it looks like the barn from the old estate that. F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda used to live on is visible now from, from Edgemoor. It's down on the water. It looks like it's old enough to have been there at the time, but all those old print shop buildings and industrial buildings have been torn down and that barn's still there, I think. Harry, is that the one that's threatened now? Well, it's, yeah, in fact, I think they've, they've got the demolition permit. Right. Uh, it's, it's a barn that goes back to, I think the 1820s. Uh, we were involved, we went over there and looked at it. There's not, there's not a lot historic about the barn except that it's old. Um, it's, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's not a charming Lancaster County barn. It's a, right. it's a big old industrial barn. Um, and it's, it's literally right where the, the, the ships are gonna dock. And so they, they had asked to tear it down. It's in pretty bad shape as it is. Um, you know, if I think if Caesar Rodney had been born there, we probably would have fought it hard. But it, it uh, but other than its age, there, there was there's not a lot. There is a, a University of Delaware somebody I don't remember who did a, a study on the barn within the last year. This university's chat yeah. group, yep. Um, and. Uh, but yeah, it's not going to be there long. Yeah. If you're really, really interested, Dave, I can plug you in. There is a section 106 process going on right now. And I, you know, kind of what Terry said, I wasn't sure if, um, it was worth it to 
participate in just because we all have limited bandwidth. But if you're interested, I could get you plugged in <laughs> to that. It, it, that sounds, it sounds like it's one of the, it's marginal anyway, the way you've been describing it. But, um, you know, it would be another thing if uh, the DuPont company had to let the Ellerslie Mansion get full of termites. Right. You know, that, that would be a nice building to have down there now. That, would, is that, a, we, that we would have fought for. Um, and it was kind of a shame because they tore down that building. The bond company used it for years and they tore it down just before people sort of realized that these are historic assets that they have value. Uh, I think they tore it down in the early 70s. Yeah. And James and everyone, we need to find, just like Ivy side, the, there's a tally house just behind the tally library which is yeah. a stone house i'm sure james could tell you more about the history than i certainly can but it's all overgrown right now but it's a stone house um you know totally gutted at this point but i don't know about gutted but you know i don't i don't know what shape the roof is in and whatnot but it's kind of small um but i you know i think where there's a will there's a way and um if we could all get together and sort of just like the Jester farm found the Jester art space to, and then the county restored the exterior and put in all the infrastructure and everything, the electric and, and water and sewer and everything. Uh, and then the nonprofit Jester art space group is going to do the inside and use it for programming. And they've raised, um, I think, uh, close to a million dollars to do the interior. I think you know, if we could find, just like we're trying to do with Ivy Side, we need to do the same thing for the tally house behind the library. Like I've thought maybe it could be like a, a coffee shop or something for when there's soccer games there and people coming to read their books or, you know, play on the playground or the dog park or whatever. Um, that's one thing I've thought of for it, but we need to, we need to do something before it's next on the demolition list. Yeah another county owned property. <laughs> right. It was a life estate for Miss Tally. That was the, the way that it was written when the Tally sold the property to the county. Um, and she lived much longer than I think her parents or the county ever dreamed that she would. <laughs> Thought she would. And basically ended up being a crazy old cat woman. Um, and so when the county employees would go and be wanting to you know, repair a screen or take a look in the house and see if there were things that would, she wouldn't let anybody in. So part of the part of the decay was because of her being kind of eccentric and, and being scared to let people in. Um, but, you know, in the 15 or so years since she's died, the county certainly has done it no favors. Um, uh, several historic preservation planners ago, uh, they did go in it. Um, there was reported to be snakes in the basement, which caused me to not be interested in touring. But um, <laughs> at, at They're just garter point, snakes. Yeah, well, maybe, I don't know, but I, I'm not a big fan of snakes, historic or otherwise. Um, so, but it, it is right there by the library and certainly could be some, some way adaptively reused if, uh, if we put a little mind into it and, and the county decided to embrace its history. Yeah, yeah, so we need, to, we need to keep on top of that and see what we can do there. Yep. One final thought, question? Yep, chime in. James, you have uh, shared an astonishing amount of very interesting ancient history of our area. And I'm wondering if there was one piece of it somewhere that should become part of First State National Historic Park, what would it be? Um, geez, that's a good question. Some of us were talking about that the other day. Um, and, and that really was, I was about to ask you on that section 106 review, how far that went up, whether it went all the way up to the intersection of Route 13 and, and, to, and um, Naaman's Road. Um, I, I think for us, one of the things would be the Robinson House. Um, it's a shame what we did with the intersection where we put the intersection basically at the front door. Um, and if there could be some way to, in all of that that's going on up there, uh, change that intersection to put some of the front lawn back. Um, but I think the Robinson House would be a strong contender. Um, I don't know, I'd have to I'd have to give it some hard thought about 
other things um, that might be in Brain Wayne Hundred that that would be of consideration. But that certainly would be top of my list. Would be the Robinson House. Well, I would I would add too, and I know Pam's on this call. Um, I know for those of you who might know Mike McGrath, who was the founding director of the Delaware Farmland Preservation Program, um, and and also involved in preservation. One of his top priorities as when he was at the Ag Pres program was to make sure that all the historic farmhouses throughout what is now the National Park get preserved. And um, I think that happened, like all of that, the, the creation of the National Park actually happened after he retired. But, um, but nevertheless, we continue to wrestle with the farmsteads that the National Park now owns um, there's one right in front of the pilot school that I've been trying to help that they actually own it. The school owns it. And I've been trying to work with them to make sure that doesn't get torn down. I've given them some grant money and tried to help them raise other money. They did, um, replace the roof recently and put on new gutters and stuff. So hopefully, um, they were, they had applied for a demolition permit. So hopefully, uh, we've got that situation turned around. If anyone is interested in living in that farmhouse and restoring it, I think they would be open to, you know, either like a long-term lease or some kind of resident curatorship or even subdividing it and selling it. So if anyone's interested in that, they should really approach pilot school. And then there's, you know, all the other farmsteads that Woodlawn used to own all throughout the national park that, um, and Pam can probably speak to this better than I can, but the, barns and farm farmhouses and whatnot, we need to make sure that the National Park Service takes care of them properly. And I was hoping that all of that would be put in a historic district overlay in the county. But um, so if and when the, the National Park is expanded to include like for instance, um, Twin Pines Farm on 202, if, if they do expand the National Park boundaries, we should try to advocate to make sure that any historic resources become under historic overlay in the county. Right. And th that just adds a little bit of protection. It's not a panacea, but it would help. And for what they're charging for rent for those homesteads on the <laughs> oh National my Park, they, they certainly should be able to do some preservation. Yeah. With them. I looked at <laughs> yeah. one of them, it was $3,500 a month. Yeah. yeah. And they're not maintaining them very well. So, um, it's, yeah, the Ramsey House is is my main concern that they own because it's not something that anybody's living in, and yeah. it's just sitting there and continuing to deteriorate. Yeah, well, and you may or may not know that there was a house on the Pennsylvania side that was a small house that Woodlawn had been renting, and then they stopped. And during the negotiations for that land in Concord. Um, the Park Service insisted that that house be torn down because they didn't feel that it was financially worth fixing it. Yeah, which really is scary and disturbing that that was allowed to happen. But that was a condition for them taking that land. Yeah, but down it went. Ouch. There's um there's one farmhouse on Concord Pike. I think it's a farmhouse anyway by its appearance that nobody's mentioned and Widener's sitting on it. It wasn't in good shape when I walked around it a little while yeah. ago. That's Jane uh, Maroney's Jane, old house. Yes. I was just gonna say that, yep. Yeah. And we uh, we actually met with Widener uh, about three years ago with Jane Maroney um, and just encouraged them to actually put it under historic overlay. But um, I, I, I know that didn't happen, but I do know that Widener law or at this point, Delaware law, I guess is, um, undergoing a master planning process. And also they've, their campus is sort of a ghost of its former self. Um, they've got a lot of vacant buildings, not just that one. So I think, I don't know what the future holds there. They already tried to sell off that property um, to a particular buyer and that fell through. So that is something we should definitely remain vigilant about and, and if anyone you know, wants to help try to work on it, we should try to convince Widener to, to do something with that building. Yeah. And the other ones that are also threatened and, and university related, uh, the barn at um, the new Wilmington, Wilmington University, 
and the old eight square school, which is where my grandmother went, um, one of the last remaining stone schools left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I met James, with... they told me, Will Mew told me that they use it for their security team, which I've never even seen a car there. I saw a truck there because I passed by there on the way home from work every day. I saw a truck there once last week, but other than that, I have never seen anybody there since they put the fence up. Because I thought it would make a while. great, yeah. I thought it would make a great ice, ice cream stand for High Point. You know, wouldn't Ooh, that be I awesome? Thought. I point wanted yeah, to make a great ice cream stand out of the tally. A jester, the I, or, or a jester, I know. Well, but still, the high, high point's right yeah. there. Like, wouldn't that be cool? We could have our own Woodside Farms in Brandywine 100. Jay I wouldn't be willing to pay that rent. <laughs> but, I had previously met with the, with the previous president of Wilmington University um, about it being a natural home for the Brandywine Education Foundation, which I had founded. Um, because of it being an old school and would give us a place that we could hold our meetings and things like that. And he was all for it. And then he retired. Mm. Right. Yes. Because he had promised that as much as you promise anything during all of the development hearings. I remember that. Oh, um, yeah. Jack had promised then, that it would stay and that the barn would stay, which is why we've been after him uh -huh. to do what they were supposed to say. And, and, you know, there's deterioration occurring with the school. You know, you look at it and there's, you know, some of the plaster is coming off the the walls I mean it's a fieldstone building underneath of that but still they're not taking care of it and I'm assuming that there's some water infiltration going on in those walls mm. we should try to try to revisit that because I haven't yeah. talked to them since before COVID all right unfortunately I have to go and call my daughter before she goes to bed so <laughs> thank you thank you thank you James and thank, thank you James. everyone for being here and um, hopefully see you next month. We'll send out an email. I, I tentatively, Councilman Cartier is.